Uh, welcome everybody. It's indeed a pleasure to have all of you with us at the multidisciplinary platform, uh, Global Conclaves. Uh, live meeting happening at BKC, Premier Financial Center globally. Sandeep, yeah. you are a veteran. Sandeep, but thank you with a uh, rich experience in financial markets, ABN AMRO, okay. uh, CLSA, UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland, Aditya Birla, uh, private you. equity, and <clears throat> always keen on studying a deep dive and updating uh, on a regular basis on developments uh, globally has been a part of India growth story for decades and recently uh, migrated to Australia and one of the green uh, very uh, entrenched countries everybody loves uh, down under and back to uh, BKC uh, sharing insights on uh, Vivek Patra uh, continuous series Vivek in Sanskrit is discrimination and Patra latest newsletters uh, is a uh, in Sanskrit word on latest update, on latest developments. So a lot of developments globally and in India, big event happening today uh, on a Saturday. A working day has been declared. Interesting. Monday, uh, big developments globally and the world will be watching us. So a period of transformation. So can we have a presentation, a short presentation as usual, interactive, so people all over the world globally can benefit. And a big team out here has collected at BKC, uh, elite team, the finest uh, minds sharing great ideas and uh, collectively the finest and sharpest brains in the world as far as wealth creation is concerned, wealth creation for the world, for India, for the India growth story. Right? Are you ready, Sandeep? Yeah, sure. I think uh, rightly said, it should be a global scenario which we would be looking at. And uh, I would want to make it more interactive rather than me speaking. And uh, the reason is because the subject itself, uh, everyone would know what I'm talking about. And I want to be interactive because some of the questions which I might ask, you would be knowing. At the end of it, I will summarize everything, uh, including my uh, representation of what could come around, you know, what might happen in the future. The perspective which I'm talking about right, right now, I'm going to talk about right now, is the aspect where India is heading towards, and everyone says that India is heading towards becoming the third largest economy. And, and people are skeptical on how would it happen. Uh, some of the data which I'm going to show you, I, I don't think most of us have that data, you know, with us uh, on a comparative basis. And, and that's what I have actually tried to, you know, capture and, and see uh, whether, you know, we can discuss amongst ourselves and um, from the point of view of where we are heading, is something which we want to understand. The presentation. We know it. So I'm, I'm starting off with the presentation. Um, to begin with, I'm taking a few slides on uh, on the India growth story, but from the regulatory point of view, um, I just wanted to highlight some of the things which have happened during the last quarter that that's been our forte actually uh from the point of view of 
what we do in as a think tank in Vivek Patra, the India Growth Story, and if if you see the title actually and and the subject, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, and be truthful. I think that's the motto which we've had always. And if you are truthful, um, I think we'll be blessed with many, many, many more years of fruitful life and peace. So to go on, So, uh, coming to the first thing which uh, everyone knows, it, it'll have to be dis uh, disclaimers because yeah. as I always say, I might not be the right person to talk about the markets, the global scenario. Uh, and if I talk about anything futuristic, uh, it should be with a pinch of salt. You should be uh, talking to your uh, specialist, your advisors, when in the case of it, you know, investing, you need to take their advice as well before investing. Here, I'm going to be looking at the macro level uh, picture. So it's, it's not going to be uh, a great deal of futuristic views, but still at least the last two slides might be, uh, unless you force me, I won't tell you what the future foretells. Uh, so there are a few things where, you know, the Reserve Bank of India came out with some circulars. And, and this is more to do with exposure ceilings to individuals and group borrowings for, for urban cooperative banks. And why are we doing this, actually? Uh, you're looking at a scenario where uh, India is going into a growth stage. The RBI does not want the sector, the financial sector to have problems going ahead. And, and the reason is very simple. It's expanding at a rapid pace. And we have cooperative banks. We have seen in the past, I, either the cooperative banks or other banks also falling flat um, due to <coughs> you know problems at their end, whether it is debt or a leverage. And, and that's one of the reasons why uh, these things have come into the picture. So especially from the point of view of cooperative banks. And we know the uh, cases, you know. So in this case, exposure ceiling to individual group borrowers uh, for cooperative banks has been enforced as of the 16th of uh, January, 2024. And that's more to do with individual borrowers uh, should individual borrowers, the ceiling on their, the bank's, capital should not exceed 15% of the tier one capital. In, in terms of the exposure to the group, it should not exceed 25%. So that's one of the things which was there. And even to the sectors, there have been sector limits imposed on the cooperative uh, banking industry that they can't exceed a particular limit. The second uh, circular which was on the 19th of uh, December 2023 and this was more to do with AIFs. What used to happen was uh, private equity funds. There were investments in private equity funds but the banks also were investing or rather lending to the companies in which the private equity funds had invested or were invested in. So the, the problem was, it was dual. To circumvent the problems of defaults by the ultimate companies in which uh, the money went, uh, the RBI thought it better that instead of the dual scenario, the bank should invest only either in the private equity company or in the companies directly. It can't be rooted twice. If there is any money which goes as an investment or lending towards the private equity company that can't be lent further down to the uh, the companies in which 
the portfolio companies as they are called, they should not be investing in those companies. So that's a regulation which, again, you know, these are things which are the RBI is uh, taking to see that there are no defaults which hit the cooperative banks or any other banks because this is not for cooperative banks, this is for all banks. What percentage is it? Uh, there, there's no percentage because they have, they have clearly said you can't and if they have invested, you should actually within 30 days they need to come out of it which is which is strange you know it's a it's, it's a burden on the banks to come out of any investment uh, so as of now there there are no there was no restriction as such but uh, on the limits there was no limit but what they are saying is you should not clearly clearly you should not have two positions one with a private equity company and lower down to their portfolio companies. So this one thing, the one thing is relevant is very, very big in the sense that the PNL of all the banks are going to get hit in this particular quarter in a very big way. That, that, that is the uh, problem which, and, and this is the debate which is going on. And there are, there are representations which have gone through uh, to the RBI saying, you have, you have come out with regulations which say you need to get out of it. But within 30 days, how is it heavenly possible? Um, you need to give time. Uh, so I think they will hear it out. Um, and so supposedly, they will come out with further regulations to that. Or uh, There was a news that it would be postponed. Yeah, exactly. So there, there has to be. It, it, it can't be you know unilaterally imposed. The third aspect and the very important aspect, which was a little further back as of the 16th of November was the uh, lending to of personal loans, uh, which the limits, the weighted risk appetite for personal loans as well as lending to NBFCs was hiked from 100% to 125%. What it means is the banks need to capitalize themselves and the risk weighted risk weighted averages of the capital that needs to increase. They the definitely to increase their capital. So, if I talk about all these three aspects, risk is the one thing which comes out in common. So the RBI is definitely looking at it from that point of view, and and it's it's good to know that the RBI is looking at it as so that the financial sector. If the economy is growing at a rapid pace, we don't want pitfalls. And, and that's one of the reasons. And it's a good scenario to have where the regulator is overseeing all these things. Now to come, sorry, now to come to the uh, semi-circulars. There have been semi-circulars. I'll go through that broadly. In, in fact, they were broad framework for short selling by individuals and institutional investors, where they said that uh, you can't have naked sales. Uh, you need to have stocks or, and uh, there is a, a borrowing and lending mechanism which will be put in place. And that has been going for long. I don't know why it's not been implemented even after so much of discussion. So that's something which uh, SEBI wants to come out with. Then there's a uh, foreign investment and alternative investment funds for uh, AIFs. The other one, if you want to go through that, I can click and uh, if you want me to go to, into the depth of it, do you want yeah, to- Yeah, go ahead. We can do it for three, four minutes. It's very important development. The first one. Short selling by individuals and- Movie, uh, I don't know whether it, if I click it, it goes to the next one. Yeah, uh, mouse and you refer to AF one, right? Yeah. Yeah, AF one. Yes. No, no. If I click, it goes to the next uh, slide. So I will have to escape and possibly do this. Yes. Yeah, so 
framework of short selling. So you know what short selling is because that has been defined there. And this is for retail as well as institutional investors. So the exactly what I had said, naked short selling. Oh, 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 oh. Naked short selling shall not be permitted in the Indian securities market. And accordingly, all investors would be required mandatorily to honor their obligations by delivering stocks. So this has been going and gone for, I don't know, a long, long time. And in fact, I, I can think of about 10 years back also yeah. the subject had come in, but it's not been implemented. So unless you actually see the FNO section going into compulsory yeah. deliveries, I, I don't know whether this could happen or not. So this is something which needs to be you know, looked at. Delivery was square off before a certain day. So rampant speculation is uh, replaced by uh, calibrated speculation. Uh, absolutely. Because the uh, objective of markets is to provide liquidity and uh, calibrated speculation is needed for ensuring liquidity. But ramp rampant uh, speculation by muscle power and money power and bullying, bullying the markets to money power, that uh, is the objective Sort to see stop. stabilization in markets. And we have among the best uh, regulators in the world, both RBI and SEBI have been doing a wonderful job and coming out with uh, uh, regulations which ensure not only financial uh, stability, but also a well-calibrated uh, uh, growth uh, for the India growth story. So the relevant uh, uh, markets uh, provide uh, uh, opportunity for capital investments, both through equity and debt market, right? Yeah, that's right. And the next one is, again, uh, in, in terms of, you look at both the uh, regulators on how they are going about it. Risk, anti-money laundering, because even in terms of uh, the foreign investments in alternative in investment funds, they are looking at the beneficial ownership of who is investing. You know, from the point of view, and, and if you remember way back in, I think, 2004, 2005, SEBI first uh, came up with a, a problem where they had come very harshly on some of the broking houses, FII broking houses. And uh, that's when the first signs of money laundering and anti-money laundering came into the picture. They asked, started asking for the beneficial interest uh, of the investors. And we had to go to the last piece and tell them who is the actual investor. So there were layers and we had to go to the last investor to tell Sebi that this is who the investor was. <laughs> so uh, this again is a I risk. Now in this, they have mentioned that uh, final beneficial owner should be known. No? Exactly. Yeah. So this is what is uh, in fact, for the AIFs, the next one is, it, it's very simple. Uh, the brokers, every broker has to sign up uh, and tell uh, their clients about the terms and conditions on which the broking will take place. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's very simple. It's not uh, something which <laughs> one can't, uh, you know, foresee. Then the next one is, again, anti-money laundering. Uh, from the point of view of the Securities and Exchange Board of India. And this is for combating financing for uh, against terrorism. Uh, so there will have been amendments to the anti-money laundering um, guidelines, they will, you know, what I foresee from doing this, we are covered under FATCA. You know, if, if we have to stay in line with what the standards are abroad, we need to be observant of these um, specific facts 
and make regulations so that we are covered under the Anti-Money Laundering Act. And that's the reason why SEBI as well as RBI is initiating these. To come to the next one, um, and, and this will be interesting. This will be something which will be interesting and here the questions start for you. Now the global events and issues influencing growth and prices. Why analyzing global statistical data is warranted and form the base for gaining knowledge on the financial and the capital markets. This especially when the global economy is in the flux. Now what is happening around can you make a decision on what is going to happen in the markets tomorrow? Because it's completely dependent on the global scenario. Some country might fail. The US is not doing well. China is not doing well. So what happens to the global economy? What will India do? Where are we from the perspective of India growth story becoming <laughs> the number three economy in the world going forward. So these are the questions and how do we uh, answer those questions? We see the macro conditions of each of the countries. And what I have done uh, to take this scenario forward is I've started comparing the macro and the micro, micro factors. What are macro factors? The inflation, fiscal policy, interest rates, national income, that is the GDP, international trade and employment levels or the rate of inflation in labor costs. I have not taken the last one purposely because it, it really is difficult to have that in terms of all the countries because it's not available except for the US. They give out periodical inflation rates for the labor as well. You know, how much, what is the wages paid uh, for labor? The other countries don't track that. So it's, it's difficult to really envisage what happened, what is happening there. Micro factors could be a derivative of uh, all the above, mainly on demand and supply scenarios. And, and this is where uh, it comes to. These are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, of the largest economies in the world. Um, I've taken EU, the European Union as a group rather than picking up uh, Germany or UK or any other country in that group. So if you see, let's let's look at one of the biggest ones, the GDP. US, the GDP growth is 1.5%. I'm, I'm talking of annual. The last one was 4.8 or 4.9. Uh, so I'm not looking at that. This is the data which is coming from uh, the I sorry, um, this is the data which comes from I IFC Washington. And the IMF, I've taken all the data and I've agreed on, uh, you know, they have agreed and allowed me to take all the data from their portal and reflect it as a survey, you know. So this has been done specifically by taking all the data, most of the data from the IMF. So US annual GDP 1.5, EU 1.5, Australia 1.2, India the highest 6.3. And this is annualized. I'm, again, 7.2 or something of that sort is the last uh, data which was there for India, but that, that was for the last quarter. So this is annualized, how much it would be for year 2024. China is 4.2. Now, <clears throat> inflation. Inflation is 2.8, 3.6. I'm not going to actually read out. You can actually have a look uh, on what it is. I'm going to keep it for some time there. Now, what happens in, in terms of uh, these? It's very interesting to know that each of these things are, you know, dependent on each other. And I'll show you how in the next slide, because it's a complete cycle. Um, 
which translates from one to the other to the other. I'll, I think I'll take that this first. This last row is what? A billion dollars or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Billion, okay. billion dollars. China has only 190. Balance of payment. Ah, only 190. 190. Surplus. Surplus. Yeah, only 190. Yeah, it is. 780. No, no. This is, this is from their website. They have come down a lot. So you you need to have you know in relation to three years back they would come down a lot. L let me let me take this slide first before I. Can you see? Can can everyone see this slide? You know I'm starting off with lower government government revenues. What happens if you have lower government revenues? It'll be high fiscal deficit leads to higher inflation, leads to the possibility of higher interest rates, higher unemployment. Higher unemployment leads to lower demand, leads to lower GDP, which is in turn lower balance of payment, higher fiscal deficit, and again, lower foreign currency reserves and higher external debt. Again, that leads to higher deficits. So it, it's a complete cycle. And that's one of the reasons why I've taken this up where, you know, from the point of view of what is happening, some of the, the highlights of this will be, if you look at the debts on, on the, uh, row number one, two, three, four, the debt for the US and they are struggling to actually pass it through their, uh, you know, Congress. The higher debts, uh, which which they are uh, the budget which they are trying to pass through. You have one hundred and five point one five as the debt to the GDP. Debt to GDP, a hundred and five percent unsustainable. And it's even higher, forty eight percent. Japan is 248. So I think all in all, I'm I'm looking at India, which is only 69.07. But December, not December. China, no, December, China has the highest 285% of the GDP. Yeah, but how come when China is over here 43%? That's no, 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 wrong because that China is wrong. being much higher than India. No, no, that is wrong. Which one? That China. Percentage of GDP is. Uh, no, China's GDP is way, way higher. 18 trillion dollars. <laughs> and uh, their debt to GDP is uh, as of December two eighty five percent. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, because it's uh, okay. Do you want to actually see that yeah, data? IMF has released a report on uh, debt, global debt. I've taken it from. Uh, the... According to that, it is two fifty five billion. China debt will be much higher. Now than... at the end of December, it is two eighty five billion. Uh -huh. So this is this is old. Two thousand fifteen. Yeah. Oh, so this is old. Two thousand fifteen. This is old. Things have changed. <laughs> this, this is old data. This is what was there. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not actually central government data. This that's much recent. That's much better. Correct. Mm. So I picked up from the, the this data from the uh, IMF website itself uh, because it is comparative because all the data is not updated. Yeah, this is based on surveys. Yeah, right. But so we are very clear. It is sourced clearly the IMF website. Yeah, absolutely. And they are taking the latest uh, reported available with them. No, 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 no. Reported. They, they this is so based on global debt in the month of December, according to which China is the leading. Country. But that's oh, not IMF, on the report. Is, uh, yeah, uh, we have to take authentic because they were clear they direction are, on. They are given country wise, country wise debt. Yeah, it's a big report. I've gone through the report. Okay. But at least it's not on the website. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Authenticity, yeah, website, website authenticity, and reporting. Yeah, that's important. Okay, then you have the central government gross debt to the GDP. That update can be we'll share it. We'll, we'll share, share it. it. We'll share. Yeah, it. We'll, we'll, we'll share that. Uh, yeah, we'll share website, it. Yeah. yeah. The central government debt to the GDP again. Japan is way high. Um, even the US is way higher. 82% is uh, India, <coughs> China at 
foreign exchange reserves again if you look at the us if you think that foreign exchange reserves for the us is high look at the reserves 242.29 billion versus 604 for india uh, 1294 for japan 3380 for china so i don't for one know how uh, the rating agencies rate the us because if you compare these this data um, how in actual fact is the us actually able to sustain this uh, you know their rating they have been brought down uh, you know lately they are ratings are uh, pay, they are headquarters in us only no? so but but then lately they have been reduced yeah, but, but not, not still much. not it not that much. Been, yeah, it's not appropriate but there's a reason for that Plus one reason all one reason of course fantasy. he said uh, uh, they are based in us so the masters owners are there but the most important point rating agencies look at uh, liquidity and ability of repayment and because uh, us by its self appointed position of being the liquidity manager for the world that's what it proclaims uh, because it has an advantage and which is justified to a large extent because even China, a rival country, a hostile uh, re approach recently due to various reasons, they also parked their foreign exchange surpluses uh, in the treasuries. There is a reason for that oh, because where bonds. do you where do you bonds. where do you keep it? The, this is this it, is it's, it's really vital. But we'll come to the next point, which is more vital. This is just one aspect. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, so you're right, actually. The, the Chinese bond, uh, you know, the investments in the U.S., this is um, not of the recent uh, past. It's way back in 1980. They started doing that. That's during the Gulf War. It, it even dates even earlier. They started investing in the U.S. Uh, economies. That is when they started actually generating surplus. And that's how they started investing in the U.S., and if the biggest fear for the US is if China actually withdraws that those investments from the US, what is going to happen to the US economy? Mm -hmm. So it's that's a major, major factor. Yeah. You, you want to uh, say something? Yeah, we'll go. But um, uh, best thing is uh, itself, uh, this week itself, the RBI governor at Davos uh, has actually. Uh, clearly communicated be ready for a multi-currency work a world and the banks here are also ready to do transactions in multi-currency in fact a private sector bank yes bank has done the transaction this week on multi-currency on the technological platform and most of the banks uh, foreign banks private sector banks public sector leading ones are ready for this multi-currency that will bring the big change in 2024 and beyond for the India grocery. Let's move ahead. There's a lot to yeah. uh, discuss. Then, then the next one is the fiscal deficit. Um, if you see the fiscal deficit, China is moving up in terms of fiscal deficit. It's now 7.4%. Uh, India is 6.4%. EU and the uh, US is somewhat manageable. Central bank rates, and, and this is what I said when I showed you the diagram. What happens you know, for the interest interest rates? What is going to happen in the future is something which is unknown. What happens if, uh, you know, the Red Sea, uh, there is a complete blockage in the Red Sea and oil prices jump. Inflation will, there'll be chaos again. What happens if the war in uh, the Middle East expands to other countries? There'll be chaos. So there are two factors which go along with this. The US Fed has already said People are, you know, jumping, uh, saying that the interest rates are likely to come down. Fed might bring down the interest rates. Day before yesterday, our governor also has said, people and investors here are also saying the same thing. But that's not true. Um, we can't lower the uh, bank rate, the central bank rate, immediately. It might take four months, six months. It depends on the geopolitical scenario. So, all in all... You know, from the that point of view, we need to look at the overall scenario, and and that is one of the discussion points I've I've been talking about. We need to look at the overall scenario. Then comes the balance of payment. Uh, 
US versus China, US versus China, um, 165 deficit versus China is 190 billion. So all this data is, and the links to that data is, you know, what I've taken from, and I've already, already talked about this. To round up actually, uh, so the global worries pertaining to the debt situation in the US accentuated by the stalemate and the passing of the government budget due to the political problems there is what is uh, the issue. US continues to have a big balance of payment deficit. Global inflation is still high. We don't know how it will be. It's noticeable that if you look at one of the things, and I'm not talking because I'm coming from Australia, um, <laughs> if you look at uh, one of the scenarios here, uh, the fiscal deficit, Australia is the only country with a you know, fiscal positive, a surplus. surplus. And it augurs well for that economy. If you see the, the whole scenario for uh, the growth is not as much, but Australia is a country which is for one reason or the other, a little stable. But growth matters, that is a key thing. That, that, that is something which is a known And factor. it is uh, impacted uh, significantly by so geopolitics. I, I already said that, you know, it's a conundrum of, uh, for the central banks on what is to be done from the point of view of uh, what to do in terms of the central bank rate. And, and if China does not, you know, <clears throat> grow, then we are looking at a scenario of stagflation, deflation, whatever you call it. So that, that's where we stand at present. For that country, which can be a big mega opportunity for many other countries, and particularly like India, which is a developed country, which has arrived. And uh, it really huge, huge uh, manufacturing uh, made in India is happening here. And the world looks at uh, sourcing from India because of Indian quality of products is very, very high. That is the key reasons. And uh, earlier, China was also known for a lower quality and a opaque, low transparency. Mm -hmm. And it has now come to India, and uh, which has arrived, and lots of things. Now we'll look at the latest situation in terms of the moments worldwide in the markets. Not worldwide. Uh, this is for the Nifty. And, and we see the scenario as of yesterday, actually. And uh, you can see what has happened, actually. The... It was moving in a channel. Uh, it's broken the channel and fallen. It's trying to go back into the channel. But uh, if you look at the, if you look at what is called the arithmetic to the uh, to the level it should go, uh, it has a minor correction still in the offing. So that is one of the things which is there. But uh, one never knows. Again, I'm again saying dis, uh, disclaimers. You take your own decisions. What does the long-term uh, outlook looks like from this chart, uh, 2024? This, this doesn't show anything at all because from the point of view of uh, the, uh, at least from the oscillators, uh, the last oscillator is still at 49.5. Okay, the last oscillator is the analyst oscillator, which uh, that, that's the program I use. Uh, that oscillator is 49.5. It's not across the 50 mark. So we are there. But let's look at let's look at the next one. This is at 50.55. This is the bank nifty. And the bank nifty has fallen and it's fallen sharply. It's actually taking support at that level. So let's see what happens. It has fallen and, and you know the reasons why it has fallen. HDFC Bank is the sole uh, you know, component of what has happened. And people were jumping with joy when uh, and saying HDFC Bank would be the largest or one of the largest banks in the world uh, in, in terms of size after the merger. But what has happened? The loans to the deposit ratio 
has completely gone haywire. <laughs> the loans to the deposit ratio for HDFC banks is, is 110%. And what the scenario for the banking sector as such is 90 to 95% is okay. And the central bank takes that ratio as a conservative basis of 75%. So where what are we seeing in terms of uh, HDFC bank? 110% loans to the deposit ratio. Either they have to cut down on future lending or they have to actually deposits. Yeah, exactly. And how are they going to do it is something of a question mark. Or a mix of both. It has to be a mix of both, but they can't do it. Uh, well, actually, there is no question. Uh, there is no question mark about it. The selling was very, very small. Uh, Five thousand crores, eight thousand crores. When global selling in the last few uh, uh, days uh, was in billions, uh, it was in billions. So it was uh, just a small fraction about it. And the deposit growth is fantastic in the system. And loan growth is supporting the Indian economy. In fact, they have been very conservative in wholesale lending and retail growth. So they are servicing the economy. They are increasing market share. There is no issue. There are some vested interest or some uh, people who desperately needed money. They had no choice. So they had to sell. And possibly it could be a great opportunity. Very well managed bank. Uh, this bank, HDFC Bank, has uh, last uh, uh, few days only uh, got the award for the best uh, uh, financial reporting excellence, right? Yeah. This week it has happened. And most prudent bank. And they have made contingency provisions, which are not required by RBI regulations. Uh, contingency regulations uh, for the regulations on AIF. They need not have done that. In that case, the uh, uh, earnings uh, uh, would have been much higher. Pad growth will be much higher. ROA will be much higher. Point is, uh, when somebody needs some liquidity, at that time they sell. But it's a great advantage. And the governor himself has said very clearly, RBI doesn't mandate any uh, LCR ratio. And uh, uh, finest practices latest quarter is very very clear opportunity is there now you whether you look at uh, uh, this uh, bank which has got uh, weightage over 10 percent in indices it could be a thing but we have seen global selling of uh, billions of dollars in the last few days absolutely and in india the fii sale number uh, 5000 crores 6000 crores just reported uh, uh, this week and which has also reduced pointed is it when you look at it it could be a good opportunity and the bank lending uh, growth, which they are talking about, SBI chairman has talked about it and the RBI governor has talked about it to look at uh, lending growth is always a multiple of the GDP forecast. And India is the fastest growing economy in terms of GDP. So these are the finest banks and finest lending practices, finest, finest uh, financial reporting practices. So we had to see everything in the 360 degrees perspective very, very clearly. Yes, move, move ahead. This is a set the context, right? For the 360 degree views, right? Everybody in uh, so, tandem? Yes. So so the, the only thing which uh, uh, I would like to say is uh, the uncertain scenario still persists. And that's one of the reasons why the regulators are coming out with risk-weighted averages or limits. And uh, from, you know, from my perspective, we are heading towards, uh, you know, a good scenario where we are looking at India growing because the GDP, in terms of the GDP, there is no question that India is on top in terms of the GDP growth. Uh, China is falling. China is likely to fall because they are sector. They are sector the real estate sector is in dumps once the real estate sector goes into a decline that's followed by the decline in the financial sector and once the financial sector goes down the currencies get hit so it's it's a it's a ripple effect for for uh, the chinese economy whereas for india it's the reverse uh, yes, in India, 
2023 shows the best performing sector was the real estate sector. In 2024 also, uh, whether you look at today or uh, last week, the best performing sector is the real estate sector. So a crisis in one country brings opportunity in another country. There is booming demand, booming for uh, ready delivery in most of the places are not available. There is demand for bigger apartments. Uh, one BHK upgrading to two BHK, two BHK upgrading to three BHK, three BHK upgrading to four and five BHK mm -hmm. uh, farmhouses huh? uh, or uh, work from home, uh, multiple houses, uh, huge demand and uh, supported by uh, low cost uh, lending uh, based on the real uh, real interest rate over inflation it has never been so good it's a very very sweet cycle and real estate drives the economy in terms of generating employment and also uh, infrastructure sector we had a detailed uh, deep dive discussion whether it is cement whether it's steel or whether it is electrical installations or it is plumbing or decoration you know it drives the demand it drives employment which will drive gdp growth further it uh, it starts it uh, triggers a bull run in the economy through sustainable uh, sustainable growth, so which is a great advantage uh, and a sweet spot we, uh, we are in, and uh, the country also moving up the ranks today, uh, top five in market cap in the world, and going to move higher also, and even international stocks are going to be listed soon in the uh, gift city, and huge opportunities for. Uh, infrastructure lending also Next. so no, i i think this this is the end of the uh, you know in in terms of the charts but uh, one thing which i wanted to uh, discuss and this is more of i i remember last february on what we said in terms of uh, you know the budget scenario they gave emphasis they gave a lot of emphasis on infrastructure and like in the previous session, uh, what Manoj said was infrastructure always, you know, budget versus the implementation was negative. So from the point of view that this year, the infrastructure uh, implementation has been the greatest. It's a plus for the Indian economy. If, if you look at uh, the other scenarios also, I, Again, let me go to the. Yeah. yeah. Can we come on the last slide? Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the last point which I wanted to uh, make is what happened during COVID. The problems on deficits have been because of COVID, if you look at it that way. So, from the point of view that India was saved because they did not have huge deficit during the COVID period. What they did was put money into the infrastructure sector, which actually, you know, started the cycle of uh, growth. So that that's all from me. I from think... crisis to opportunity. Absolutely. That has happened. Huh? Yeah, and absolutely. we had a crisis and we are the country which created a big opportunity. And it's a re really a great uh, 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 thoughts, great minds. And can I request uh, Aditya come, come forward in the screen and present a uh, a token for love and affection. Please, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.